what is the best action for the nurse to do, and one of the answer choices is about what the patient is doing, then there's a mismatch. <clears throat> you need to try to figure out where in the nursing process this question is coming from, because that tells you what you need to do. So is this question about assessment? Are, they trying, are we trying to figure out if you know how to assess, if you know what is the best assessment data? Objective assessment data is the best. Subjective is next best. Um, or is this about you prioritizing and planning? Or is this about that you know how to do this particular procedure safely? You are suctioning somebody who is intubated. Do you know to hyper-oxygenate before you cut off their, their airway supply? Start sucking them out. Or are you just gonna, or do you know that you're only supposed to suck for 30 seconds at a time and you have that suction go on for like two minutes and they're like turning blue and passing out? Um, do something versus do nothing. Is this a question where you should be doing something? Remember, we usually don't waste the whole, we only have 75 questions at, you know, at, the, at the minimum to ask you all the things that you have learned about over this year. We're about to try to teach you a whole bunch, right? So we, we don't have time to be wasting questions where there's no problem and we just expect you to keep on doing what you've been doing. Continue to monitor, continue to assess, wait and see. Like we, we really usually don't ask questions um, like that. Sometimes we do to see if you know because what we also want to do is protect against rogue nurses, right? Ones that like want to jump out there and we're like they, they um, they're, they, they've got a little, they're bleeding from their leg a little bit, we're ready to go chop off the leg. Um, so, we, you know, jumping out there ready to do something, go do something that ain't broke. Um, we'll get to that in a second, the, the, the road nurses. Um, patients first, then equipment. Now, there is um, one exception, really. It's um, kinking of tubing. Anytime something is not flowing right, um, check the tubing. But other than that, we always address the patient first. So if the patient is got a catheter in, if there's any kind of tubing attached to the patient and there's a problem at one end of the tubing, like urinary retention, um, check the tubing first. That's the first thing that we do. The most important thing is always to make sure the patient is you know, alive and kicking. Questions? Um, and we never leave the patient. So if there's ever an answer choice that has you leaving the patient and there's no one there taking care of the patient, that's the wrong answer all the time. We never leave the patient. Um, so use your whiteboard. Um, uh, in the NCLEX, they give you a little whiteboard that's about the size of a piece of paper um, with a marker that it, you know, it's erasable, but it's really not. Um, and, and you can write on it. And they give you as many as you need. I definitely say use your whiteboard, because on my, on my whiteboard, I'm writing down those keywords, since I can't underline on the computer. And, um, and the other thing that I'm doing is I'm numbering my answer choices. So I'm going to go over here for a second. If I have a question, 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 it's long. And um, I've got answer choices. Oh. Um, So I've underlined my keywords, okay, and I've got these choices. Now, if this is a process of elimination question, I'd like to try to eliminate three of these answer choices. And as I'm going through my steps, I want to know which ones I've eliminated so I don't have to go back and try to figure out and remember what I've, remember the work that I've already done, the mental work. Um, and when I have twisted myself all around and I'm still trying to figure out these two, um, and I go back and read the question, and I come back down here to my answer choices, I know that I'm still just between these two, and I'm not going back and spending time trying to refigure out if that, those are right or not. Um, if this is a priority question, one of the first things I'm gonna do is label them. Okay, this one's physical, this, the, the rest of these are psychosocial. Oh, so I have one physical, and the rest are psychosocial, so that means that physical one should definitely be the priority. Does it make sense? Well, this is about um, infection, and this is about bleeding. So even though it is a priority, it's not related to the question, because the topic of the question is about infection. So not only do you have to prioritize, but you have to see, does it make sense? Um, topic is important. So actually, this one doesn't make sense. It's about bleeding, and this is about infection. This doesn't have a single thing about bleeding in it. Um, 
Because if, if the question is about it, we're good, there's going to be a clue in there. I mean, otherwise, we, we could do anything. Um, so now I've got these three psychosocial ones that I have to decide between. And um, maybe these are risks. And this is an actual problem. And this is the psychosocial that I choose because it's an actual problem. These are, this sounds good too, Both all, but all three of these will work, but this is an actual problem and these are risks. So that's how I decide which one is the priority. Did that kind of make sense? The way I use my whiteboard to kind of work me through the process? And um, also pace yourself, because it's better that you pace yourself and do 75 questions than you start the line because you're tired and you uh, do 275. Okay, these are what keywords look like. They are time frames. They are diagnoses. Symptoms. Now that's the biggest one right there because a diagnosis could be something that you've never heard of. It's some big extra long word, medical terminology. Um, but the symptoms are what's important because that's what we address. He can't breathe good because he's got down on her for I don't know. The point is, he can't breathe good. I, I, I studied your decision making. That's my best example. The point is, he can't breathe good. Doesn't matter what he has. Age. For, so, for those of you who are in pediatrics, you're going to learn about growth and development. If there's an age in there, it's probably important. Um, Absolutely. Time frames, oh, we already got that up there. I said it again, it's important. If there's a time frame in there, that may make the difference between who you go see. Somebody who is, you know, had, um, is having an issue and it's been going on for 36 hours versus someone who's had an issue and it's been going on for three hours. Well, 36 hours may be a little bit more chronic than something that's going on right now that's acute. So you have to think about it in those terms. Time frames are important. There are no absolutes. If you see something that says none, never, all, always, you pretty much guarantee it is not the right answer. Nothing is ever guaranteed. Nothing is ever absolute. <laughs> that's a little oxymoron. Nothing is ever absolute. Y'all didn't catch that. Two, two absolutes in the front. All right. Um, okay, so here are your must-do situations. So, so sometimes you have to, you get a question and you have to decide, am I supposed to be assessing or am I supposed to be doing something? And how do you know if you have enough assessment data? Well, here's a key thing that you may not know. You should always assess twice. You should assess and then confirm. So. Patient says, um, I'm in pain. That's subjective information. Um, on a scale of one to 10, it's an eight. Now that's more objective. Um, someone is um, blue around the lips. They have cyanosis. Um, you check their oxygen saturation. It's at 74. Mm, rapid response. <laughs> unless, they're, unless they're a baby. Um, so sometimes, so how do you know if you have enough assessment information? Sometimes you want more and that's not an option. What you want to assess, they didn't give you that option. They gave you some other options that you can assess. How do you know if that assessment data is good enough? Does it give you any more information than you already have? Let me give you an example. Um, you have a patient who's, you have a patient whose blood sugar is 65. Which response by the nurse is best? Ask the patient what they ate for breakfast. Um, nope, I got a better one, I'm sorry. Take your time, pace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> a patient with a history of diabetes reports feeling shaky. Which response by the nurse is best? Ask the patient what they ate for breakfast. Check the patient's blood sugar. And two others that don't matter. <laughs> Check the blood sugar. It gives you the most definitive information, right? Okay. Uh, let, let me give you the same one, a little bit different. Um, patient with a history of diabetes. Blood sugar is... Uh, Hmm. I may have to think about another one. Um, 
Okay, patient, patient. The nurse is assessing a patient and palpates a bounding radial pulse. Which assessment by the nurse, which assessment should the nurse do next? Um, also take for an apical pulse. Um, I want to say uh, check the blood pressure. Yep, there we go. Yeah, there you go. And two others that don't even. And one was about infection, and the other one was was like check the check the CRP, and the other one was um, ask him if he's in pain. There we go. So your choices are apical pulse, blood pressure, ask him if they're in pain, or what was that other one? Check the CRP, C-reactive protein, it identifies the infection. What are we going to do first? Take the blood pressure. Apical pulse is more the PMI, but blood pressure would be definitely. How many of you all say um, apical pulse? You must vote. Raise your hand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How many of you all say blood pressure? Blood pressure is more defensive. Blood pressure is defensive. Sorry. You want me to pass it? If it's a deficiency, then it's a fault, and that can explain it. You have something. Okay. I'll do it able because that's the reason. Who said blood pressure? Why is blood, why are you wrong? I know you're going to be confident. Why are you wrong? See, that's that second guess. Let me tell you what that is. That's, um, I got the right answer, but I know I'm wrong, so I'm just going to go back and change it anyway. Yeah. Why do you think you're wrong? Um, she's about to tell us exactly why she's right. But go ahead. <laughs> because I'm not 100% sure, but I had a question like this on the top of Google. But so I you're saying that I wouldn't do I wouldn't do the apical pulse because it's a bounding pulse, so that's already like you already took the pulse. So that's why she thought she was wrong because of exactly the reason why it's right. Which my point is two reasons. So here are my two points. Um, remind me your name, Kaylin. Kaylin. Kaylin, Kaylin, um, do not change your answers. Trust your instincts. Go with confidence. Go with confidence. And um, oh heck, what was that other one? Um, yes. We all we already have it. We already uh, assess the pulse. Yeah. It's not giving us any more information than we already have. What could be causing it? Could be a pressure issue. Let's get some more information. Let's check that blood pressure. I had another one. And I wanted to make a point about why. But um, yes, don't change your answers. Go with confidence. These are must be situations. If you have enough information to know that somebody is in respiratory distress or that any of these things are occurring, then we are past assessment, okay? If they are hemorrhaging out, we do not need to check the blood pressure to see how much blood has pooled on the floor. We just need to save their lives, okay? Right. So, so there is no assessment if they are if they are actively hemorrhaging. We we're past the assessment part. We need to do something if they are having an anaphylactic reaction. Now, this is important. There are two types of allergic reactions. One is um, uh, local, mm -hmm. and one is systemic. systemic. This is the systemic one. How do you know that a local reaction has turned into a systemic one? either the blood pressure, heart rate, or respiratory rate has been affected. Right. So if they say they have been stung by a bee, in, come in contact with any kind of allergen, or that you think may be an allergen, and they say something about an alteration in breathing or circulation, that is an anaphylactic reaction and we need to do something. We're not gonna wait and see what happens or ask them, have you ever been stung before? Or we're just gonna pull out that heavy pen and shoot them in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Hypoglycemia is another one. If you have enough information to know that they are hypoglycemic, that is not shaky. I could be cold. But if I am shaky and thirsty, or shaky and another, well, at least one other symptom that you that both we both know goes with hypoglycemia, that's enough. So you need at least two symptoms. Hyperglycemia is not the same thing you got blood sugar about 600 and still be walking and talking and, and spitting out your fruity breath and all of that. <laughs> but hypoglycemia, 
you go down quick, literally. Um, safety issues, spinal cord issues or injuries, falls, head injuries, those all go under safety. So anything that has to do with increased intracranial pressure, falling, because you may hurt your spine or your head, spinal injuries, all of those are safety. And I know we talked about risk for injury. Risk for injury is kind of like automatically a safety concern. It just isn't auto, it just actually is. If they're at risk for falls, that's pretty, um, that's a priority. Um, okay, questions on that? That's why we always need to call bell with it. Yes. Therapeutic communication. Here are all the things that you don't do. Oh, and some things that you do. So, open into questions. If, the, if three of the answer choices, okay, you're between two answer choices on one of these communication questions, and you're like, I don't know which one it is. One asks, one is an open-ended question, and one is a closed-ended question, you automatically know it's the open-ended question. So we try not to ask questions that get a, a response of yes or no. We want the most information we can get, so we ask open-ended questions. Um, the only time we ever really ask a yes or no question is, are you suicidal? Okay, I don't really hear about it. You need to know. Are you going to kill yourself right now? Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? Take <laughs> <laughs> so some of y'all in psych yet. That's all we wanted to know. You care? You want to kill you? Nope. Do you have a plan? Write it down. I just need to know. Um, don't ask why. We don't ask why. It's like, um, sir, you need to take your medicine. I don't want it. Well, why not? Because you know that you need to do what we said that you need to do because we're the bosses and, and if you don't, you'll be non-compliant and what we say goes, why wouldn't you want to do what I said? Because they're an adult and they can do what they want to do. Um, we don't say why, it's like accusatory, it's, uh, it's uh, critical. Um, we don't explore. Now sometimes we validate. So if they are like, I just want to die, does that, or no, here's another one. Um, I just feel so lonely all the time. What's, what do you mean when you say lonely? Or um, do you, tell, tell me more about this loneliness. Uh, no, we really don't really want to, I just really want to clarify. Tell me, no, tell me what you mean when you say lonely. I really don't want a life history. Like we don't get paid psychiatrist or psychologist type money. So if someone says, I'm so depressed, tell me all about it. That is not, that is outside of your scope of practice. We don't have time for all that. We'll be there for days. That's probably why they are there inpatient. I mean, we are, and we are, we don't have time for that, so don't explore. Don't explore. Don't say, don't worry. Everything's gonna be okay. You don't know that. False. False. <laughs> that's the, and that's your opinion. Um, don't focus on the nurse. We don't care about the nurse. We care about the patient. <clears throat> Objective information. Be empathetic. I can understand that losing a loved one can be very hard. Validate their feelings in the situation. We don't persuade them. Patient doesn't want to take their meds. Um, so we say, if you don't take your med, this is what will happen. What we don't do is go get their wife and be like, you need to tell your husband to take his meds because he's acting up and he won't do what we said. Or we go get the family member and tell the family why it's so important that they take the meds. Like we, we're not gonna do a whole bunch of persuading and getting other family members involved and, and call, you know, calling the doctor on him to tell him he's not gonna take his medicine. Um, he has a right to say no. They have, people have a right to say no. Otherwise, it's assault, just so you know. Um, if this is a single patient and you and it is a priority question, how do you know it's a priority question? First. First. Key, those key words, first, best, most, priority. Um, if it's a single patient, this, this patient has X, Y, and Z going on, what should the nurse attend to first? Use your ABCs. And then you figure out what's going to be the most therapeutic. Checking someone's blood pressure is not the most therapeutic if I'm trying to figure out more about their infection. Right. And the least invasive. So there go my rogue nurses. Don't 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 go trying to amputate something before we have. Or let me see. What's what's one? Um, uh, before we before we lift the elevate the head of the bed, which is the first thing that we do if they're having breathing problems. Let me say that again. Positioning, raising the head of the bed is the first thing that we do when somebody's having breathing problems. The first thing, um, before we go try to intubate them, let's at least try to raise the head of the bed first. Even before we start slapping oxygen on them, let's raise the head of the bed first. So least invasive to most invasive. Um, if this is multiple patients we're talking about, so who does the nurse see first? ABCs, 
I just go and label them. That one has an airway, that one has an airway, that one has an infection, and that one's just sad. Um, and then I'm like, okay, who is the most acute? Because this one may have a circulatory issue, but they have had chronic hypertension for 30 years. That's where those time frames come in. And this one has an acute infection. No, I'm still going with circulation first. Um, I got it. You got, two, you got two circulations up there. One is chronic and one's acute. You go for the most acute one first, right. or you go for the one who's most unstable, or it's something that's unexpected. So if you've got two normal patients who are going through their normal course of whatever is wrong with them, and then you have something unexpected happen, like an adverse effect or side effects we expect. Right. So we're not talking about side effects, we're talking about an adverse effect or an ad, the patient. you're giving the patient blood and all of a sudden they start to have a reaction, that's unexpected and that's a problem. And we deal with real problems first before potential problems. So actual nursing diagnoses before their risk. So, we, so that whole safety thing, I'm kind of back to it because I'm trying to give you examples of when you would prioritize. If you've got someone who has a risk for falls and someone who has an actual circulatory problem or someone who has, yeah, circulation always goes above safety anyway though. And if you've got someone who's got an actual a risk for falls and someone who's got an actual infection, I'm still going to attend to that risk for falls first because it's a safety because all I need is for them to fall out of the bed before I have a chance to get that antibiotic started. They they will be okay, but if he falls out of the bed and hits his head, next thing you know, he's you know, with CPR and all kinds of stuff. Safety safety goes after ABCs. Now, if it's a process of elimination question, those keywords are your best friend because the key words make the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And you need to be asking yourself, does the answer choice address the problem? So if this question is about infection, like they've got this crazy diagnosis, but all of the symptoms are about infection, and the answer choice is about breathing, that does not address the problem. And, and we wrote the question with the problem in mind. So we want to know, can you address the problem? Don't be slapping oxygen on him and he's over here with a raging infection. He didn't even have a breathing problem. There's nothing in there, there's nothing in there that said anything about breathing. Um, think about what the outcome is. Focus on the present. So questions that ask about past information, tell me about your diet history over the last month. Um, Tell me about how you, anything that is focused in the past, we are not really concerned about. All I want to know is, are you going to die right now? Like, what are my assessments down the, the body system list so I can see that you're okay in the present? I really don't care about what happened in the past. Say that for your psychologist. Um, okay, so you've got all these tips and tricks, and you're still down to two answers, and you can't figure out what to do. Um, Go back to those big words in the question that you didn't really know what they were and try to break them down and see if there are any um, patterns. So let's see, for example, um, the first one that comes to mind is like the medications because those are always pretty hard to remember for me anyway. So I know that like all the ones that end in LOL, those are all beta blockers. So I don't even have to know what the med, and they always give you the generic and the brand name. So you'll always have that atenolol or whatever it is. Um, next to whatever the brand name is, because that changes all the time. So, um, look, so look for patterns like that. Um, I can't think about any more off the top of my head, but as you come across these words, um, I would ask your, I, I would just really try to pay attention to what the breakdown is, because uh, what the root words are, um, and see if they can kind of give you a clue about what we're talking about, or at least the body system that we're talking about, right? Um, so expect that the right answer, the right answer that you want is not going to be there. So what's next best? Um, if you have two right answers, you need to always go back to your keywords or look at those two answers and see what makes them different from each other. Because whatever it is that makes those two answers different from each other, that's the key thing that they're trying to discriminate against. So that's probably, that's your clue to what they're trying to get at. Um, there's a pattern in almost everything. 
So for example, you'll see lots of questions where the answer choice is two of them are assessments and two of them are interventions. The first thing you need to decide is do I need to assess more or is it time to do something? Is this a must-do situation? Um, if I need to assess, okay, I got these two assessments. Which ones actually address the topic? Both of them do. Okay, well, which one is the most definitive, objective? Oh, well, this one. It's a lab value. I like that better. We can go with that one. Um, confidence is key. No second guessing, no changing answers. And the NCLEX hospital is perfect. If the option is there, you have it. We don't have time for you to go try to ask the doctor for an order. If the answer choice says administer this, you already have the order. Um, the NCLEX hospital is perfect, so there are no workarounds. Um, so, what, so don't mistake what you do in practice for what is expected on the, in the NCLEX perfect hospital. <laughs> So one of the things that I, one of my, now I won't say my pet peeve, but one of the things that I kind of, in my head, I was shaking my head. They're like, well, in practice we do, and I'm like, Lord, Jesus help us in practice. Um, sometimes I have done clinical rotations where I'm like, everything that you see is a lesson in what not to do. So let's just be clear about that. Um, I've seen some really good hospitals where I'm like, everything that you see them do, you need to try to emulate as best as you can. Um, just kind of depends. Uh, but, the, but the team, the team is what's most important because a, a team, hospitals that have great outcomes and feel good to be at have great teams and those teams stick together, they have job security, um, the, the, the teams that are dysfunctional, they break apart, there's no job security, they have a high turnover rate, they um, have high costs, the unit ends up breaking down, um, it just, it, it's, I've seen it time and time again, it, it's bad. Um, nurses get caught up because errors occur and somebody has to be the fall guy. Um, again, I suggest um, malpractice insurance. So here are all the type of questions that you will see. Um, the multiple response, I am just so sorry that um, you all have to take these because it's not fair because it's like five questions in one. It's like five process of elimination questions in one. Um, so with that being said, I would not spend five questions worth of time and energy on something that's only going to yield you one answer or one point so the best thing I can tell you is it's alternative format um, so it won't be the bulk of your questions and I wouldn't stress out about it so that you miss the next actual five questions um, we already talked about these two I just want to say this about this process of elimination question. Three answers are not correct. So there are no two right answers, and I have to figure out which one is the best one. No, all three, three of them are wrong, and you need to figure out why they're wrong. Um, these fill in the blank questions and drag and drop items. So the, um, the fill in the blank, that's your math calculation. Please make sure you know how to calculate math. Um, and give it to them in, in the increments that they ask you for, they will tell you. So make sure you're watching that decimal point. Um, exhibit items um, require you to maybe look at a chart and so it may ask you about a temperature or the trend of a temperature which is a really important thing let me just take a second and say this I don't care this is really important hear me now let me say this now I don't care as much about what their um, now let me, let me see how to say this their current temperature is important, but only relative to where it has been. So, uh, or um, blood pressure, for example. If their blood pressure is 138 over 84, is that outside of normal limits? You say no. So, but that, so normal, so we say you are hypertensive if you are 140 over 90, right? right. So at 136, 1, 120, 132 over 86, that's technically not hypertensive, right? right? We'll look at that number and be like, oh, they're fine, keep on moving. But if they run 100 over 70 on a regular basis, that is hypertensive. Right. So, so what's important is to know what, what their baseline is and what the trend is. Um, and so you may get a chart that has like um, seven or eight temperatures and you have to determine that the trend is that this temperature is going up 
And even though it is not outside of normal limits, they may be developing an infection. That's anticipation. So it's not just about what, so I say that because in clinical, for example, when you come to me with an assessment, or I, I come to you, because I usually have to find y'all and then stalk you, and, tell, and say, okay, give me a report on your patient, tell me what's going on, and you're like, their blood pressure is 120 over 80, and I'm like, okay, um, what do they usually run? I don't know. Well, what that 120 over 80 doesn't mean anything to me if they usually run, you know, 140 over 95, because then I'm like, well, hey, that's good. Hold that blood pressure medication. Um, the last thing I want to tell you is about hot spot items, where you have to, or the, the drop and drag, or no, that's um, where you prioritize. I remember them. The hot spot items, where you have to, you have a picture. This is the picture, and it says, click on. You're like, you didn't quite get it in the right spot, so this is what I can tell you. If it is in a picture, a graph, or a chart in your book, you should definitely know it. And like that's the important stuff. I usually just flip through my book and look for the graphs and pictures and charts and stuff. And, and that's what I, I try to absorb. I, um, if I, especially if I don't have time to, to read everything. Um, although you should read for understanding. The hotspot items. So you need to know where your anatomical locations are. So for example, if this is a question about breathing, what are the anatomical locations for where we listen for breath sounds? Lungs. They didn't outline the lungs on here. The what? Quadrants. Yes. Not for um, air. Not for um, breathing. For. Um, for which one? Can you think? Vowel sounds. Vowel sounds. Vowel sounds. Vowel sounds. So quadrants is what you need to think about for vowel sounds. When you get ready to um, to, to point and click, you need to divide the abdomen into four quadrants and make sure that you're smack dab in the middle, uh, maybe out a little bit because you're close to the middle, um, but in those quadrants. Um, for breath sounds, let's try again. Anatomical location. Your lower Intercostal spaces. We count them. Same thing for heart sound. Intercostal spaces. So if you are listening to for the apex, I believe if you're listening to heart sounds and listening for the apex, it's intercostal space, which means you need to count intercostal spaces because if you put it in the fourth, that's wrong. That's real wrong. For lungs, for breathing sounds. Um, for breathing and for lung sounds, we use the intercostal spaces as anatomical landmarks because the intercostal spaces also helps you know where the lung is. Like, so if it's the left lower lobe or if it's the middle lobe or the upper lobe, um, the upper lobe is in the first two intercostal spaces, the middle lobe is in the third, and then the lower lobe is in the fourth and the fifth. So um, you definitely want to use your intercostal spaces as a guide, but you don't want to just be like any, many, mighty on this side, right there. Um, let me see if I have, okay, that's all I have. Oh, Questions, comments, concerns? Um, oh, great question. Let me have your attention. Um, the question came up about questions worded in the opposite. So, um, the nurse would be negligent if she did which of the following. You're looking for something that's wrong, that she should, that she should not be doing. Or um, which, of these, which of these responses by the nurse is least effective? So you're looking for the one that is the least effective. So you have to prioritize. So instead, um, instead of choosing one, you need to choose the fourth one. So I guess what I'm saying is pay close attention to the direction of the question. Are they looking for something right, or are they looking for something wrong? And you, you, and in fact, um, I often teach that you need to write that up there with the topic. So you wrote down the topic. It's about breathing. It's breathing too fast. Um, and to the side, I put anxiety because that's why. But the topic is about breathing, and um, they're looking for the a response by the nurse, and they're looking for the wrong response. 
which response would be incorrect or which response would be least effective or so I put the word wrong up there because as I'm going through my answer choices and I'm like man I still end up with these these two and I can't figure it out I go back to my keywords and I'm like oh they're looking for something wrong and I hear and one of these is wrong and one of these is right and that's how I think that's how I decide which one so so make sure you know the direction yes Sit on the questions, don't spend too much time on when they have they actually put something in order to make for answers. Do they try to answer? You should spend set amount of time on set amount of time on the questions. You should get every question due diligence, but I wouldn't get it more than due diligence. So the So make sure you get it in um, before you leave out of class. Otherwise, you may, somebody may ask you why you were absent then, because that's how I'm taking attendance. Um, now, you all over here, I got about 18 names on these sheets. Who, where are my other sheets? That's it, that's all? I don't have my That's for uh, level one. That is for level one. Oh, okay. You gonna sign in? We, we all just like, we too many people. Okay, so what I'm saying is, make sure you have time to attend the sheet. I think your next class starts at noon. Happy lunch. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I just gotta start writing now. I didn't know. I just came late, so I have to write it. Oh, I just slipped.